your Bible, turn to Acts. The Acts of the Apostles is what that's really called. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. This is the, uh, follows the, the progression of the New Testament. The New Testament starts out. Uh, obviously, and justifiably so, with the life of Jesus in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then, uh, do you remember who wrote the book of Acts? Luke did. Luke, the beloved, what was his occupation? Physician. And... Um, so he uh, write, and who did he write it to? Theophilus. Very good. Um, and he wrote it to, he also wrote the book of Luke to Theophilus. Uh, he wrote the story of the gospel, and then he wrote the account of what all happened in the early days of the church. Now, Something to keep in mind here that I think a lot of, um, a lot of the Pentecostal um, and charismatic or non-denominational churches, uh, I think this is where they go wrong. They see at the very beginning of the church on the day of Pentecost that these men are speaking in these unknown languages. That then leads people to believe that God gives that to everybody who is saved. There are, and not all Pentecostal or uh, charismatic uh, churches believe that, but you have a, a large majority that does. They believe that if you're saved, then the evidence of that salvation is you will speak in tongues. Now that's not, that's not in, in a doctrine anywhere in the scriptures. Paul does not mention that in 1 Corinthians 14 where he deals specifically with the doctrines concerning speaking in unknown tongues. He does, nowhere does the Bible say that that is the manifest sign that you are saved and that you have the Holy Spirit. It's not there. What you have to understand is, um, and, I, and I've equated this, the, the story of the book of Acts, to the birthing of a child. What is the first thing a child does when they are first born? What's the very first thing that happens? Huh? They start breathing. Their lungs, and what happens the very first thing on the day of Pentecost? They gasp for air. They start breathing. Very first thing that happens, okay? And um, when you look at the book of Acts and you look at the, the history that it's giving you, you see that things at the beginning of the book of Acts are somewhat different than how things end up toward the end of the book of Acts. And what you're seeing is, you're seeing God is building the church just like a child is being born and it grows, okay? Early on, um, after uh, we get done with Acts chapter 2, what you're going to see is that all of these people who got saved on the day of Pentecost and some, uh, you know, others afterward, well, they all, they're all banded together and they're all one. And the Bible says that they have all things common and that uh, there's no, uh, whoever, whoever owned anything or ever had any money, they all bring that in together and everybody lives off of that. And that sounds wonderful and there's been different groups for the last 2,000 years that have tried to emulate this without God's blessing and it doesn't work, okay? It, it doesn't work if you're wanting to join, a, like in the, in the 60s and early 70s, these communes were popping up all over the place, the hippie movement and so on, and everybody thought it was going to be this dream land 
where everybody has all things common. They share everything, including their wives and husbands. And in some cases, their children. But they share all the food. They share all the money. They share everything. Share all the drugs. But after a while, what happens? The people who are out working, bringing in the money every day are going, if I'm going out working every day and this guy's sitting around getting high all day, sleeping with my wife, how come I can't stay home one day and get high and sleep with his wife? And it all starts caving in. It doesn't work. So, but it did here in the early on in the book of Acts. And it's because it's, it's just like, uh, it's just like in conception, when a child is conceived, for a while, all the cells that make up that child are all exactly the same, okay? But after a while, this thing called cell differentiation kicks in. And all of a sudden, you've got a group of cells that they, they split off from some other cells and they're still, I mean, they've still got the same DNA, but there's differences in them. Because God is going to take these cells, he's going to make a brain. God's going to take some other cells and make a heart. God's going to take some cells, going to make lungs out of it. And as time goes on, those cells, they start joining together to make the heart, the lung, the brain, the bones, the skin, uh, all, of the, all of the processes of the body. Uh, all of that happens, and that's what you see in the book of Acts. After a while, they're not all giving everything that they've got. And there was no commandment from God that they do that. That's just how they were doing it. And so keep that in mind. Um, you know, I was young once and had all these big ideals of how all the churches should get along and everybody should be the same and we should all have everything common like they did in the book of Acts. Then I grew up, okay? And I realized that there are some really good Christians who go to other churches that have a little bit different beliefs than me, and it's probably a good thing that they go to other churches because I'd be mad at them if they came here, or they would be mad at me, and we wouldn't get along, and eventually they would split off anyway. That's how it works. I had a young man here several years ago. He came... Uh, uh, with another pastor friend of mine, and um, he found himself in agreement with a lot of things that I was teaching, but that put him out of agreement with the men that uh, whose churches he was uh, in with. And he asked me that question. He said, "He said I. He said I've got some good men, good preachers and pastors." And he said, I don't doubt their salvation. I don't doubt their honesty and their, gen uh, uh, their genuineness and so on. But he said, how is it that they can believe differently than what you and I believe? Uh, is, is, are, are they not saved or, or what? And I explained that process to him that, that babies go in. And he said, that makes a lot of sense. And I said, God does make people differently. It's same DNA, same book, but he does make people differently to do different things and different functions in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 teaches us that. And so uh, when we look at the book of Acts, it's needful to keep that in mind, that this is not uh, God's instructions on how we should be doing it now. It is a historical um, story of how he did it and how the church grew from that point and went forward. So, uh, let's pick it up in uh, verse 4 of chapter 2. Uh, this is what I have up on the screen. Very good. And... Um, Verse 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem uh, Jews, uh, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now this, uh, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. 
Uh, and they uh, were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And um, I'm not going to deal anymore with this issue of the languages and what God was doing on that day. Clearly, he was sending a sign to Israel um, that um, their time was up. In other words, I'm going to speak to the Gentiles now, just like I said in Isaiah 28, uh, with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to this people? So, uh, we're going to start now in verse 14, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day that you've given us. Lord, it's a beautiful day today, and we thank you for it. We ask God that you bless your word tonight, and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can learn these things and learn how the church got started and what you did then and the, uh, the, uh, the analogies that we can get from this, the learning that we can get from it. Lord, we can see in, in our own growth as Christians that this is how you're, you were doing it with us way back in those days or maybe with some, Lord, that you're doing that now. Uh, but Lord, you're not done with your work. You still have things that uh, we have yet to grow into. So Father, give us patience as we study and as we learn tonight. Uh, Lord, uh, help us, dear God, that in all things that we wait on you and wait for you to work in our lives. And Lord, just we ask God that your word does in us what your word is best at doing. And so Lord, uh, help us to grow, help us to mature. Teach us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Uh, very quickly pray for uh, Lisa and I tomorrow. We're going to hit the road. We got a long, hard journey to go tomorrow. We got like two hours of driving going to be rough yeah uh but when you see lisa tonight shake her hand and tell her thank you she's thinking of you she bought toilet paper for the church extra toilet paper for the church tonight i know it there's a there's a dock worker strike or something like that i don't know any any reason's a good reason uh, but anyway, all right, so in, uh, in um, yeah, we're, we're going to be, um, I think it was, what was it, Gasconade Baptist Church, uh, I can't remember the, <laughs> the name of the little town that's going to that's gonna be in, I gave the, uh, huh, Dixon, Missouri, and I gave the address on yesterday's Pastor Mike Online, so if you listen to that, uh, if you are in that area and would like to come, we'd, we'd like to have you there. Looking forward to it. It's a church I've not ever been to before, and so those people have no idea what they're in for. They have no clue what they're getting into, and so uh, just pray for them more than anything, all right? So in, And then after that, uh, Saturday we're coming back, and Lisa's going to stay here, and I'm going to uh, Arkansas, in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas, and I'm looking forward to that too. All right, so in verse 14, it's interesting that this is Peter doing this. Um, we don't, obviously, the Bible does not in any way establish Peter as a pope over all of the church. Does not do that. The Catholic church is wrong totally wrong in that and the proof of that is in the scriptures we're going to see by the time we get to acts 15 we're going to see that uh the, the these guys there were guys that were obviously wrong about what what it was they were believing concerning the gentiles that were being saved and it's not going to be peter who straightens everybody out. It's actually James, the half-brother of Jesus, who speaks up and says, you know, this is what I think we ought to do. 
And uh, then later on, if you like, you, you read the book of Galatians, Paul withstood Peter to the face in front of everybody and said, you are wrong, absolutely wrong. Well, you don't tell that to a pope. Pope is the mouth of God here on this earth. He is the vicar of Jesus Christ himself. It's, and when he speaks, it's like God speaking to everybody. And I'm just like, no way. I've already got a God, and I've already got him speaking. Amen? So, um, but anyway, it is, it is interesting that it is Peter. Uh, this was obviously selected by the Holy Ghost. And uh, something that you can do if you go back into the four Gospels and you look at every list of the disciples' names. Peter is in every list, he's always mentioned first in every one of them. It mentions Peter and then it gives the other ones. It doesn't matter how the other ones, they're all jumbled up there in the middle. But it's always Judas Iscariot who's mentioned last. And, it, and usually, I think in, in every case, when it mentions Judas, it's got to throw in and he betrayed Christ. He's the one that betrayed Christ. That tells you that, in, I think, in every list. But Peter obviously is uh, of somewhat importance here. As we're going through the first few chapters of the book of Acts, it's Peter and John that really seem to stand out as far as the disciples uh, go. And um, we, we find out later that Peter and John, they're, they're preaching all over the place while they get in trouble. And even though Peter and John have this sort of uh, significant standing as far as the other disciples are concerned, they're the one that takes the beating for it, okay? Uh, it doesn't pay in this case to be first because when you are first and you got the biggest mouth, then the Sanhedrin takes you and beats you severely for preaching in Jesus' name. So anyway, but it is Peter, and there's no question of that. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we know that all the, of the disciples are preaching uh, the, in, in the languages of, of the people that are around them. But uh, in verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven. Now, this is interesting to me, and I didn't make a point of this, but anytime you have mention of the number eleven, there's confusion. It doesn't matter. Uh, Genesis 11 sets the tone for that. That's the Tower of Babel. God confused the languages. And uh, throughout the four Gospels, after Judas uh, turned against Christ and he's hung himself and so on, he's out of the scene. It's, it's Peter and the, and the 11 disciples. And those 11 disciples are, if you read every time it mentions the 11, the, the, the disciples doubted whether or not Jesus had actually rose from the dead. There's, there's confusion in their minds when it mentions them as being part of the 11. And here it says Peter standing up with the 11. That number is there to show you that once again God is doing what he said in Isaiah 28 verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. And, and then God says for all that they're not going to listen. And God says, I'm going I'm to have it here a little and there a little, uh, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, that they may go backward and fall. And that's what happens to Israel. As of this time right here, even though initially it's the Jews who are being saved, by the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, well, Paul's already said, I'm not going to synagogues anymore. I'm not preaching to the Jews anymore. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. They'll listen. They'll hear what I've got to say. But as far as the Jews, I'm done. Because every time I go in there, I get beat up. It's like, it's like Tonto. You know, whenever the Long Ranger said, Tonto, I need you to go into town. I need you to find this out. Every time Tonto goes into town, they beat him up. So it's like... Tano's like, yeah, Tano, I need you to go to town. No, I ain't going to town, Kimo Sabi. But anyway, that's another story. Um, 
So anyway, with the, with the mention of the, of the 11 here, it is an obvious sign to Israel that God is sending them confusion and God is giving revelation to the Gentiles. He's opening their eyes. So Peter, standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose. Um, Kenneth Hagin made a horrible statement about this passage. He said that the disciples were actually drunk, just not as they supposed they were. He said they were acting like drunks, they were stammering like drunks, they were drunk, is what he said. But that's not what Peter's saying. These are not drunken, period. As you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this, and then with some people, that doesn't matter, I found out. Okay, third hour of the day is the best time to get up and start drinking. Uh, but anyway, uh, ye men of, uh, uh, these are not drunken, uh, as ye suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, what I'm showing you tonight, and um, I won't be here next Wednesday night, uh, to continue this, but what I'm showing you tonight is this is, I, I believe Peter is establishing for all of us preachers, whether we are pastors, whether we are evangelists, uh, whether we are uh, just men in the church that God is gifted with the ability to preach, God is, is showing us through Peter not an exact perfect script for us to follow, but an example to follow. The first thing Peter does when he's introducing his message and what he's going to preach about is he is saying, like I would say to you, take your Bible and let's turn to the book of Joel chapter 2. That's how I would say it. If I was preaching this message, everybody get your Bible out. And if you don't have a Bible, then just hear the words I say. I'm going to give it to you. But we're going to go to the book of Joel because, and Peter, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, identifies what is happening here. Now, there was no, there was no apostles meeting after they've all been speaking in tongues. The disciples didn't get together in a huddle and say, what do you think this is? I mean, we weren't expecting this. What do you think is going on here? Well, I think this is what Isaiah said. No, I think this is what, no. Peter is getting his inspiration from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has given Peter, and, he, and again, he's preaching, he doesn't have his notes. He doesn't have it all written out what verses he's going to use. He is preaching under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And he says, this is that which was spoken. And I'm saying this to y'all here, but especially to you folks online. Some of you, uh, I've talked to some people in the last few days who said they've been looking for a church, can't find one. And generally, you're right. In, in this age, it is difficult to find a church that when they're preaching you're going to see this model somehow some way in their message and you're going to know this is God's man he's following the scriptures um, because a lot of the churches now they have gone to I mean there's different names for them coffee shop churches uh, rock and roll churches. Uh, I heard another one today and I can't remember it. But um, pastors now are no longer preaching based solely on the Word of God. They'll tell you something that Winston Churchill said or Mahatma Gandhi, something that he said or something that Mother Teresa said 
or whatever. They'll, they'll give you all these quotes. None of these people have anything to do with Christianity, the Bible. Nothing like that. Peter's doing exactly what should be done. So let's say that, um, let's say that something happened in our church, and we're all aware of it, so I don't have to, I don't have to um, you know, just kind of preach around it because nobody knows. I don't know. I'm just making this up as I go. But if something happened in our church and we were all aware of it, it would be my job to get with God to say, God, what is this? And then I would stand before you and say, this is that which was spoken. This is that which is in the Bible. And I'm going to show you what's in the Bible. I'm going to show I, I remember doing this. Uh, September 11, 2001 was a Tuesday. And so the next night, I knew exactly where I was going. And so on 2000, September 12, 2001, on a Wednesday night, I preached, this is that which was spoken. And what I did was I went to Deuteronomy 28. Cursed shalt thou be in the city. And that was right out of the mouth of God. And why, why, is, it, why is it we're cursed in our city? Because we've, we've been killing all of our babies. Um, we've, been, uh, we've been praising uh, the sin of sodomy. And, um, and all the sins that America is guilty of, this is that which was spoken. And I tried to do the best I could. I mean, we had people, we had altar full that night. That was an easy one to preach, you know, because everybody's like, we ain't never seen anything like this. What's going to happen to our country? I had people calling me saying, is this the end of the world? No, not yet. And I, I could say that because I knew the scriptures. But it is what the scripture says. Jerry Falwell started out doing that that week, and then he came out five days later and said, I shouldn't have said some of those things. I didn't come out five days later and say, I shouldn't have said all that. I'm still saying it, amen? Um, but anyway, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And now he's going to give Joel, he's going to quote Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Now again, let's go to Joel chapter 2. And uh, you might, if you want to keep your place there in Acts 2, because we'll be back at it. And, we, and you can compare scripture then, if you want. You can compare what Joel said, and then go back to what Peter said, Joel said. They're almost identical, but there's always some differences. Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. There we go. Took me a while, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel chapter 2. And um, uh, what was I going to say? It was real important. I, I don't remember. Anyway, um, in Joel chapter 2, look at verse 28. This is what Peter is preaching from. Uh, that's Acts. <laughs> Joel chapter 2. Uh, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out uh, my spirit, oh, I know what I was going to say now, upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, this is one of those places that those, and I've, I've had, I deal with this in Kenya every time I go, because um, there are quite a few women pastors there um the when i went back in uh january um the first meeting that i had in was in samburu and it was with all the pastors 
and there was probably 30, 30 people there, I noticed that there was about three women there. And I'm like, oh God, come on, please. I don't want to have to deal with this. But I thought, I can't, I can't not say it because they're sitting there. So God gave me some grace on, on what to say. And I, and I said, and I, I led them into it. I said, do you believe the Bible? Yes. I said, do you believe every word of the Bible? Yes. And we went, you know, scripture upon scripture on how the Bible says it, then that's what we do. If the Bible says this, then that's what we do. If the Bible says that, then that's what we do. If the Bible says don't do this, then we don't do that. Okay? We base everything on the Bible. And then I got into this issue of women pastors. And I said, I, look, I know you're sitting here. Hear me out, okay? I said, I understand that, you know, resources are, are, are bare in, in Kenya. In other words, you've got a church, you've got a body of believers. You may not have been able to get a man be your pastor and I said I look at it sort of like uh, a, a single parent home woman having to raise the children earn the income do the things that the father should be doing but there's no father there you're having to fill in all of those places just to get your kids raised and to keep your family going uh, so I can, I can, I can have compassion on that and I can understand that if you're just going to be rebellious to God, then no, I, I'm not, I'm not very understanding because, and I did, I, I went through, okay, now tell me, um, those of you who are pastors, are you the husband of one wife? And you could have heard a pin drop. And I think an eye rolled or two. And I said, you know, the Bible gives, I don't give the qualifications. I didn't sit down and write out what you have to be in order to be a pastor. God did it. And God did it twice. He did it, I think, was it Titus and then Ephesians, one of the two. But anyway, he said, this is what you do. You're the husband of one wife. And you must rule your family well. Because if you don't know how to rule your family, you can't rule over the house of God. I said, that makes a, and I said, that was a problem I had when I was young. Because I didn't know how to raise a family, but I thought I should just step right in and be a pastor. And I said, God wasn't ready yet, and he wouldn't let me do it. Until I learned how to work a, a day's work, a man's work, come home so tired I couldn't stand up. But I was feeding my family and paying my bills. And I said, God, then finally God let me have a little church part-time. Then it went into a bigger church, the one I have now. And, and I, as I've grown, God has blessed the church accordingly. I said, but the bottom line is, he specifically mentioned that you had to be a husband and one wife and rule your family. And I said, I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't just excuse that. And then they, they always bring up, well, what about, you know, Joel 2, Acts 2, where it says your daughters shall prophesy, okay? So let's look at this for a minute. Uh, in fact, let me, um, let me see if I can put that on the screen over there. Um, I'll show you what I mean if I can get this going here. King James Pure Bible Search Software, the most awesome program in the entire universe right here. Say amen to that. There it is. Well, hang on. Get off my back, John. Okay, now. Let's uh, type in. pra sai So we're going to do a search here. But we're going to look at Ezekiel. Okay, Ezekiel, son of man, 
Set thy face toward Jerusalem. Drop thy word toward the holy places. Prophesy against the land of Israel and say to the land of Israel. And then here, son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord. Ezekiel 21, therefore, uh, thou therefore, son of man, prophesy and smite thine hands together and let the sword be doubled. The third time, um, it's not there. Here it is, 21, 28, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord. You'll find that. I don't know how many times in the book of Ezekiel, but it's there a lot. And what he's doing, he is establishing what prophesying is. We, we have, it's been used so much in, in today's world, when you prophesy, it's like you're predicting the future. Okay? Oh, uh, brother so-and-so uh, has got a prophecy for our church. He's going he's to tell us what our church is going to do in the next year. He's going to prophesy over us and tell us that. But that's not necessarily what the word prophesy means. The Bible's telling you what it means. Prophesy and say. Prophesy and say. Prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord. So, is there any place in the Bible, excepting, uh, of course, for... Um, a church service where it is clear that uh, the bishop uh, or the man uh, is the one who prophesies. But can you think of any place in scripture that would forbid you as a woman from telling people what God said? I mean, I think you could even tell your husband what God said. Honey, this is what God said. This is what the Word says. Okay? Do it with a humble attitude. Do it with a humble spirit. God will bless that because we need that. We need somebody who's not afraid of us to tell us, I ain't afraid of you. Okay? I'm going to tell you what God said. Um, but that's the definition of prophesy. And so prophesy on Facebook, prophesy on Instagram, prophesy on YouTube, prophesy on any of these places. Tell people what God said and make sure it come from here because there is no private interpretation. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. It specifically uses the word prophecy. And so you obviously have, I would say, not only a right, but an obligation to give people and to tell them what the Scripture says. You can do that in many different areas of life you can do that in. Um, you, you just can't come into Sunday school class and say, Pastor Mike, uh, um, I'm going to give you some scripture and it's going to show how wrong you are. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. Um, if that needs to happen, bring your husband privately. Okay. Um, I had a woman that came here um, and I felt horrible about this, but she came to Sunday school, and I was talking about uh, what prophesying, prophesying was and how it was uh, the, the bishop should be a man. And she raised her hand, so I thought, okay, I'll find out what she wants to know. And she immediately started objecting to what I was teaching. And uh, I said, well, I said, I'll... I said, you're trying to say that I'm wrong. All I've done is read the scriptures. And they make it plain. And she kept on arguing. And, I, and I'm, you know, what do I do here? I mean, we're online. And what do I do? And I finally said, ma'am, I said, I'm going to ask you to not do this anymore. 
she said, well, I, I kind of thought this was like an open forum here. No. And I finally had to shut her up. And uh, she got up and stormed out. I went in my office to cry. Because it, it bothered me so bad that I had to do this. I don't like that. I don't like being that way. Um, but I had to do it. And so anyway, yes, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall, shall see visions. This also um, is used in today's so-called churches uh, where they set up what they call a house prophet. Okay? And brothers, or a house prophet prophetess and the and I found out because I somebody asked me I was on the prophecy club tour years ago and somebody came to me and said does your church have a house prophet and I said yeah King James and I knew what they were getting at but I didn't know and they said no I said well tell me what that is then they said there has to be somebody in your church that uh, is listening to the Holy Spirit and is speaking for the Lord. And I said, that's the pastor's job. That's, there's one head here. But what they were setting up and establishing was, was for somebody to be in authority even over the pastor. And that person would say, Pastor, I need to correct you. The Holy Ghost has showed me. And I'm like... That I would last two seconds in that situation right there. Either I would put a stop to that in the church right then and there, and if it didn't go well, I would say, obviously he needs to be up here or she needs to be up here behind the pulpit, not me. I'll see y'all. And I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put up with it, not for a second. Uh, but that's, what's, that's what this has done. It's telling people that they should be having visions all the time and dreaming dreams all the time and, and that that's the word of God. And here's the problem with that. So let's say that, let's say that John comes in. He's excited because he's had a dream and he just knows it's from the Lord. And he tells it to me and I'm not real happy about it. And so I just kind of say, well, you know, I appreciate you telling me that. Let's just wait and see if this is of the Lord. And then Sunday comes around, he can't contain himself, and he gets up in front of everybody against my wishes and tells everybody what he dreamed and how it was from the Lord, and it's, it's for this church, and we need to be doing what God said to do. Question number one, how do we know that he even had said dream? I can't see the thought processes of his head, nor would I dare want to. I can't see into his mind. I don't know that he had that dream. Number two, if he had it, does the devil have access to our dream state? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And so I, wasn't, I wouldn't be sure whether or not that came from the Holy Ghost or it came from the unholy one. Um, number two, or number three, does it have scripture backing it up? That's another thing to look at. And, but you would be surprised at, at these churches that do this. And, that's what, and Paul addressed that in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. He said, what, but when I come in, everybody's got a prophecy. Everybody's got a tongue. Everybody's got a word of wisdom. And everybody's jumping up, showing everybody how spiritual they are because they got something from God. They just got to tell everybody about it this week. And so what you're seeing in the book of Acts is that from the, from the day the Holy Spirit was poured out, on through the successive months and years in the early days of the church, there was necessity that men in those churches were receiving things from the Holy Spirit to prophesy about. Why? There was no Bible. They had the Old Testament, 
But the doctrines of the New Testament were, were coming a little bit at a time. And um, so that's why, that's why Paul said, for now we know in part and see in part. So you take Paul's part. He didn't see everything. In fact, Paul never mentions a word about a thousand years being a day and a day is a thousand years. He never says anything like that. That was given to Peter and to David in the Psalms. James didn't talk about it. Paul didn't talk about it. Jude, none of the, uh, John didn't say anything about it. That was given to Peter. And so Paul had his part. Peter had his part. John had his part. James, Jude, and so on. All of these men had their parts. And then when you have the individual churches, yes, God is giving words of prophecy, words of knowledge, words of wisdom to certain men in those churches. And God is directing the teaching and the doctrines of those churches by those words. But here's what Paul said. For now we know in part and see in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be, what did he say? Done away. So, this is perfect. And it's complete. And so, do we have any need now for someone to be hearing new prophecies from God to tell everybody in the church? No, we have, it, we have everything right. This is something that I had to learn. God, because when I first got into studying prophecy, I, I, I confess, I was watching some of these guys who said they were getting dreams and all kinds, and I was praying for those. God, I want those. Three times I asked God for those. And three times God said, here they are. And so after that, I finally surrendered and I said, God, I'll never ask you for this again. I believe you now. And so that just encouraged me to spend more time studying the word because there's dreams and visions in here that are given. And uh, we have everything now, instead of it being in part, we have it all together being perfect now. And God has done away with that, which, including, including like the speaking in tongues and, and things like that. So anyway, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And what God is simply saying here is, I'm not going to withhold the Spirit from anybody, no matter if they are a young man, a young woman, an old man, an old woman. I'm not going to withhold my Spirit from them. I'm going to give my Spirit to everybody that seeks it, to everybody that wants it, to everybody that's asking for it. I'm going to give it to everybody. I'm, I don't care who they are. I don't care what gender they are, as long as it's just two. Uh, by the way, I, there was a story I read. I just got little bits and pieces of it. But a, um, I think it was a teacher that got fired by the local school board because he refused to use the pronouns that a, a transgender student was demanding. And uh, he sued and won a ton of money Yes! Uh, the court said he's got every right to say what he wants to say. There is no law that compels uh, anybody to call anybody anything. And um, so praise the Lord for that. Um, let's see here. I don't, I don't want to read all of that right now, but... Um, well, let me, let me just pause it right here um, because obviously Peter is going to be giving more scripture in this, in this sermon. Re the result is 3,000 people are going to be saved. God's, God's going to give his stamp of approval on this message by saving three. 
And it's not that Peter had to say, now, would everybody, we're going to play just as I am, without one plea. We're going to sing all six verses, and I'm going to wait for you to come down to one of these benches and ask Jesus into your heart. He didn't have to do that. They asked him, what must we do then to be saved? Okay, they were ready. They were ready. All right, so praise the Lord.